Good morning. morning. Wonderful. (laughs) Ah, uh, Sorry to have to interrupt your mingling uh, outside of the door. Uh, We are a little behind, so let's go ahead to get started. For all those of you who are just joining, I'm uh, Xiaowen Wang, uh, the conference chair. I thought uh, my brain was uh, tremendously nutrition yesterday (laughs) until I saw May's slide, uh, the sushi and the buffet, I did not consider my stomach at all. Um, so I fully enjoyed um, all the presentations and demos and of course uh, the most beautiful part of the mingling. In the end of the day, Jack's talk was fantastic. The powerful vision he shared, the tremendous progress made in the context of cyber GIs uh, when he put geo-design and uh, ArcGIS new tools uh, all m- blended together. Related to that context, I thought, wow, my eyeball is, is just uh, perhaps getting out of my eye. Um, so I, I was very excited. Um, and uh, of course, uh, Amy Walton's presentation, as expected, is very informative. Um, I don't need to be convinced, but uh, it's very clear. Uh, cyber infrastructure is uh, positioned to revolutionize 21st century science and engineering. And I think our community uh, has uh, been well positioned to be connected to this uh, exciting moment or stage of, uh, of science uh, going forward. Of course, in the rest of the day, started with my presentation, uh, provided uh, overview of uh, what's happening in the NSF project in particular, also provided pr- references to uh, some other related activities, followed by science uh, applications and discoveries, examples spanning hydrology uh, and uh, bioenergy sustainability, food security, to national map, to planning, um, and uh, also many, many uh, interesting examples associated uh, in the context of uh, technology and innovation, we heard updates uh, from CyberGS Toolkit, the deep approach uh, to computational data sciences and the open source environment for nurturing the next generation who has the potential and opportunity challenges to create new capabilities that would be ca- able to take advantage of uh, big data, big compute for solving complex problems to CyberGS Gateway, multiple applications, bioscope, move pattern, mobility studies. Uh, now becoming increasingly uh, easy to uh, work with and accessible to uh, many, many users. And in between the middleware uh, gets cloud resources, uh, other types of cyber resources integrated uh, and make it easy for uh, usable, uh, easy for application developers. So that's quite a treatment, but I think the highlight uh, really came to the panel discussions. Um, I thought that was very insightful and uh, stimulating. Um, Mark uh, had very interesting thoughts about uh, how the community uh, could be engaged, understanding the different needs coming from geography, but also related domains and comments from Luis Rodriguez, my colleague at UIUC, from a domain scientist point of view. Um, Of course, I mentioned already the sushi we had from May um, a transition to buffet and how did that happen? For those of you who are here, uh, that was uh, that was quite a perspective. Um, and uh, you learned uh, quite a bit from Dawn and uh, and uh, and also Search, the open science, the open source, the writing articles as you would write software, you know, open space. That was quite an idea. Um, coming to the end, the, the demo, and uh, I was quite impressed. Uh, nobody wanted to leave in the end. Uh, continue to be just mingling, mingling, mingling. To cut it short, uh, I cannot wait to start the second day. <laughs> um, it is always my uh, great pleasure and uh, great honor to uh, introduce today's uh, keynote, uh, Dr. Michael Child. And, uh, I probably should introduce him this time differently. I think what I should say is that he has a distinguished retirement career. (laughs) Uh, Mike has uh, held 
so many different records in his career, the number of books, the number of papers, number of miles, number of funding dollars, uh, you name it. Uh, but I would add one more record uh, to his long CV is uh, the number of uh, cyber GIS community meetings he has attended. Uh, so we are very grateful for, for Mike and, uh, and I think all of you would agree with, with me how much he has done for, for the GIS and uh, uh, science and technology community as a whole. Without further ado, thanks so much, Mike. So uh, thank you, Xiaowen, for that introduction, and thank you for the invitation to do this. Uh, I'm going to talk about geodesign from the perspective of cyber GIS. I want to try and link the two subjects of this meeting together. And I want to do that at a fairly technical level. So we're going to get down into some of the nuts and bolts. I'm, I'm conscious that Jack talked about geodesign yesterday. Um, this will be, I hope, um, something um, that establishes a clear linkage, a synergy between geodesign and cyber GIS. Um, I'm also conscious that Jack talked about cyber GIS yesterday, uh, it's talked about geodesign yesterday, and I hope that I'm not going to overlap too much, um, although I will have to start with a perspective on geodesign, which is the perspective that I've adopted over the past decade, um, that I think is a particularly GIS-oriented perspective, so hopefully that will, that will help your understanding of what geodesign is all about. So he here's a very simple version of geodesign, a simple linkage between geography and design. Geodesign is where geography meets design. But more importantly is the second bullet here, that geodesign intervenes in the world to achieve desirable objectives. And one of my motivations for being interested in geodesign when the idea was first mooted now about a decade ago um, is that it really offers the possibility of getting out of something of a box that I sense GIS has become embedded in. I know when uh, we started many, many years ago promoting GIS, it was with the idea that we could use it to intervene in the world. But for various reasons, which I think will become apparent as I go through this, that turned out to be more difficult than you might have thought that in fact we spent a lot of our time figuring out how to keep an inventory of where the pipes were under the streets, uh, an inventory of where the taxis were across the city, and falling short, in other words, of that vision of intervention in the world, improving the world. And so I think one of the strongest motivations for geodesign is this idea that it is about using GIS to change the world. And that, I think, is a very important point to make in our courses when we're talking to students. This is not just about keeping track of where the pipes are under the street. This is much more about changing the world. And that's, I think, to me at least, one of the strongest motivations for geodesign. So why now? M many reasons. We're increasingly aware of the need to design sustainably with due regard to the environment, human needs, cultural heritage. The whole process of design has become much more problematic and sustainability has become a major concern. Secondly, with GIS, we're increasingly able to assess the impacts of interventions. And a lot of this discussion of geodesign is going to be about the impacts of interventions. Impacts on human health, the environment, water, air quality, communities, the economy. And we can do that these days using models based in good science. So geodesign is in part about using our ability to model the world to assess the impacts of interventions. And in GIS, we have abundant resources of geospatial data about the planet. We have enormous resources of data out there. We know much more in the digital sense about the planet than we have ever done in the past. And we have access to technologies technologies for design, evaluation, collaborative decision-making. So in many ways, now is the time. This is a time when geodesign is unprecedentedly enabled. 
So here's just some definitions that I hope capture what I've been saying. Geodesign is changing geography by design, Carl Steinitz's comment. And you may have come across Carl Steinitz's book on geodesign, which I think is almost certainly the best source right now of information on the field. It's published by Esri Press. GIS is about what is. Geodesign is about what could be, emphasizing our preoccupation in GIS with dealing with the world as it is, a descriptive approach. Geodesign is about what could be about intervention. Geodesign is designing with nature in mind, Jack Dangerman. So some very simple definitions of what we're really about here. And one of the ways to, to think about this, I think, is to go back to Ian McHarg, who sadly died 13 years ago, and the school of landscape architecture that he developed at the University of Pennsylvania in the 1950s. Because McHarg argued that design had to have a scientific foundation. That in order to design the world, you had to have on staff a meteorologist, a geologist, a hydrologist, a plant ecologist, an animal ecologist, etc. And he built a team of specialists in different layers, if you like, of the world. Right? Specialists in different processes that impact the world. He also recognized, even in the 1950s and 60s, the importance of computation and the importance of remote sensing. So here's McHarg's vision that each science provides a layer of information about the impacts of a development, just as GIS provides a layer of information. So there's a very natural affinity between what McHarg was talking about, what he talked about in his book, Design with Nature, in the late 1960s, and what GIS developed into being. And so, McHarg, in a, in a wonderful autobiography, and if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend it. It's called A Quest for Life. And he says, for the first time, a department of landscape architecture, right, an art, art humanities discipline, could recruit a faculty of distinguished natural scientists. And here's a juxtaposition, which is going to be very, very important in what I have to say this morning. Sharing the ecological view and determined to integrate their perceptions integrating the arts and the humanities and the sciences into a holistic discipline applied to the solution of contemporary problems. So that was then, that was 1950s, 1960s. Roll that forward to today, 45 years later, and what would the McHarg team look like? And what would we say about GIS? I think we'd ask the question, has a science of intervention evolved? Has McHarg's vision materialized? And I think largely the answer is no. Is in intervention more scientific or is it dominated by aesthetics? And I think if you look across the field of landscape architecture and you look across our universities, you would say no, it is still largely dominated by aesthetics. The integration with science really has not happened. Has the role of technology advanced? And if so, what are its components? And certainly yes. But are its components oriented towards geodesign? And that's a point I want to take up this morning in the next few minutes. And how should we update the McHarg model? So his idea that you had layers of scientists supported by a thin layer of computation and remote sensing, how do we update that? Well, we update it by greatly enlarging his team. Because I'd suggest today we need geographic information scientists. We need people concerned with information integration, people who know about information management, semantic interoperability, visualization of scenarios, spatial decision support systems, public participation GIS, et cetera. All of the pieces of GI science, which didn't exist in the 1950s and 60s, and now have become increasingly important in supporting what McHarg was trying to achieve. So let's descend a little bit to what this means in terms of technology, and I want to try to link this then to cyber GIS. So essentially, geodesign I see as a problem in two related parts. On the left-hand side is the initial imagination, the creative aspect of design. Sketch, record. Right? Build a vision of what 
the world might look like, what the design might look like. And then on the right-hand side, the scientific part, evaluate, analyze, predict, modify, improve. So we have a very important conjunction of two very different kinds of computing. The ability to support creation and imagination on the one hand, the ability to support scientific evaluation on the other. So on the left-hand side, aesthetics, humanism, if you like, imagination, creativity. On the right-hand side, science, evaluation, modeling. And geodesign is, I think, a very important conjunction of those two paradigms. So just to um, fix this a little bit, let's have a couple of quick examples. And both of these will illustrate, I think, the, uh, the issue that I'm talking about. This one is C-Sketch. This is a project, the University of California, Santa Barbara. Will McClintock is the leader in the Marine Science Institute. And it's a project to develop ideas of geodesign in a marine environment. And here's the, the problem. This is a very practical issue. Here is Santa Barbara on the coast, up, up the coast from, from where we are. And here are the Channel Islands. And over here, way off to the left, is the other side of the Pacific and the major ports of Shenzhen and Pusan and all the others. And container ships come across the Pacific at 30-odd knots and need to get to, over here on the right, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And they have options. And one of their options is to come through the Santa Barbara Channel, which is the quickest route, therefore the cheapest route. But it's also a route which is impeded by oil rigs. And these are some of the oil platforms. And it's also a route which is infested with the blue whale, which is the largest mammal on the planet. And unfortunately, a large number of collisions have occurred between the container ships and the blue whale. And all of these yellow dots are sightings. Some of them are collisions. And there's a particular nexus here where you've got oil platforms and blue whales right very close to each other. So what we're going to do is to sketch a design. Here are some of the options. You can go south of the islands, which is longer, more expensive. You can go through the channel, but then you want to avoid the blue whales and the, and the oil platforms. We sketch, and then we evaluate. And over here are the collaborative tools needed to support the various stakeholders who have viewpoints on this debate. And they're, of course, all supported by the internet, some of them synchronously, some of them asynchronously. So we've got three components. We've got the sketch, evaluation, and collaboration, three major components of, of, of geodesign. So here's a little schematic of the local participants here, decision makers, stakeholders, and scientists guiding the process. And participants across the globe, because this is a, a problem which links China, Korea, and the United States all across the Pacific. And all of it integrated into this sea sketch technology. Um, what Will has developed has been, or is being applied in New Zealand and other places around the world as a toolbox for collaborative geodesign. So that's my first example. Um, here's a related one. Uh, which is a little bit different because here the creative aspect is not as important. This is rather more a, a scientific-based design problem. Here, of course, are the, are the ports. This is part of the Port of Los Angeles. And here are the, the um, keys and all the containers stacked on the, uh, on the shore. And so these are containers which have come barreling across the Pacific at 30 knots and get loaded onto trucks and hit the 710 freeway and grind to a halt. And these trucks are all independently operated, and they're generally not very well maintained, so they're belchers of fumes. Um, one estimate is that 40% of all the air pollution in the Los Angeles basin comes from the trucking from the port. And we have massive congestion on the 710 freeway. So what can we do about it? Well, we had a project week 
have a project at Santa Barbara tracking trucks. We have 350 trucks with uh, GPS transponders. <coughs> we track where they go within the LA basin. Here's um, <coughs> the ports. And some of them, in fact, all the way to Las, Las Vegas. I was amazed. Um, others get loaded onto um, trains and moved out of the uh, LA basin by train. And of course, a large percentage stay in the LA basin. And what can we do then to improve things? What can we do to improve the wait time which the trucks, they sit waiting to get into the port, they head out on the freeways, sit on the freeways. What can we do to improve this? What are the policy interventions? So what are the design options? Anticipating when trucks will arrive at the ports. If you can schedule the trucks, then you can reduce wait time. Developing virtual container yards so that empty containers don't have to be trucked back to the port and then trucked out again to be filled. They can be stored in virtual container yards out in the periphery, reducing the deadhead trips. Ordering the containers in stacks so that when a truck arrives, the container that the truck is due to pick up is actually on top of the stack instead of at the bottom of the stack. All sorts of things you can do, all sorts of policy uh, interventions. And underlying all this, of course, is a model which simulates what's going to happen under each of these policy interventions. So a slightly different example, much less aesthetics, but solid science underpinning it. Okay. So here is Carl Steinitz's model of the geodesign process. I don't want to go into this in detail, but all of this is described very, very well in his book. And Carl thinks of this as basically six stages, each one involving modeling and intervention and assessment. Okay. Now let's look at the various pieces that we need. What does the technology look like to do this? Number one, there's got to be a spatial data model. We'd argue it's got to be 3D because we want to consider the vertical dimension, but probably also 4D because the dynamics are important in many of these problems. It's got to represent all of the entities involved. It's got to use all of the standard GIS tools. But is that enough? And I want to come back to talking about how we need, in fact, to extend the GIS data model, and that becomes a major research issue in GI science. We need tools for creation, for design, and here's a, an example of somebody using a, a pad to design a possible scenario which can then be evaluated. But is sketch sufficient, right? So if you start this process with sketch, how does that constrain you, right? Well, number one, a sketch is essentially 2D. A sketch can only represent something that's static. It can represent points, lines, and areas but what do you do about time? What do you do when time is involved in the design? What do you do about the third, the vertical dimension? So how do we extend the metaphor of sketch to a complete four-dimensional creative imagination? Right. A major research question. Right. Number two, 2D representations don't deal with interactions and relationships. How do you capture interactions and relationships? in the sketch metaphor, in the sketch paradigm. Right? When my architect was designing my house in Seattle a couple of years ago, <coughs> I was amazed <coughs> that he was unable, he was using AutoCAD, he was unable to capture relationships, such as, for example, the insistence of the city of Seattle that my house not come within five feet of the property boundary. I would have expected that as he shifted the house around to look for the best location, somehow it would go, nah, you can't do that. <laughs> right? But it didn't, because it had no way of expressing relationships. It was dealing with points, lines, and areas, but not with the relationships between them. How do we deal with interactions? And then perhaps most important, how do we deal with affordances? How do we deal with the meaning of things, the purpose of things? which are very important in a design context. Right? So my point is simply this. If you think of sketch as the basis, the metaphor for the creative act, you need to extend it because it limits your ability quite severely. And I think this, to me, is a major, very important research question underlying geodesign. It's a question, of course, for GIS in general, not for necessarily cyber GIS. Right? 
We need methods to analyze, assess. We need a framework, an ontology, a user interface within which all of this will operate. We need performance indicators, and in many of these examples of geodesign, there's a plethora of performance indicators which can be used to assess. We need tools that provide feedback. So the dashboard metaphor, I think, is a very useful one, uh, providing simple indicators of a design. And we need to think of the process as cycling. So you begin with a sketch, you evaluate it, you assess its performance, and then perhaps you modify the sketch and go round and round and round. And you want some way of summarizing the analysis, particularly comparing different alternatives. So here are a baseline and three different options being compared using various indicators. And you need tools for collaboration, synchronous and asynchronous, allowing the stakeholders to work with the internet to support collaboration around the design. You need to be able to visualize, something of course we do very well in the GIS world. You need to be able to manage different scenarios within an internet context. And so that's the basic parts of geodesign supported by GIS. Now let's move to CyberGIS. So how does CyberGIS change this? What does CyberGIS enable that GIS by itself could not? What are the key elements of integrating the synergy between geodesign and CyberGIS? Okay. So we have GIS, we support collaboration, high-performance computing. What does high-performance computing give us that regular GIS did not? CyberGIS, very important part of CyberGIS is collaboration. What is the importance of distributed computing in a geodesign context? Right. So I'm asking you to think about how to take what we think of as CyberGIS and find its unique contributions to the science of geodesign. So where can the CyberGIS project make the most significant contribution to enabling geodesign? I think that's the question I most want to ask this morning. And all of us, I think, I would encourage you to be thinking about this. What can CyberGIS do specifically for geodesign? Okay. So collaboration, I think that's very straightforward. CyberGIS can provide a transparent, fast platform for collaboration with large numbers of stakeholders working synchronously and asynchronously. Managing a geodesign project, managing the ownership of scenarios and data. And that in itself, I suggest, is a major research issue. How in the cloud do you manage distributed data, the ownership of data, access to data, and collaboration, and the access to scenarios, and the access to evaluations? That in itself, I suggest, is a major research question. High-performance computing. What can high-performance computing offer us that GIS cannot? Right. Well, what it can mean is we can simulate over larger areas. That means we can extend the impact of a project and the assessment of its impact. So no longer do we need to limit our vision to, let's say, a single city. We can consider the impacts of changes in that city downstream or downwind or in other parts of the world. We know that everything is connected in the modern world. And yet, with GIS, we have always ignored that and limited our sites because our computing power was limited. Cyber GIS gives us the ability to simulate over larger areas. It gives us the ability to include more interactions, more relationships, essentially to avoid divide and conquer. You don't need to build a boundary around your project that is as narrow as we typically have with regular GIS because we have more computing power. It can also give us faster response time, and that in itself, I suggest, is very important because a lot of these geodesign projects with their collaboration need to work in real time. The stakeholders are impatient. They want to see the implications of their scenarios immediately. Faster response time is important, and so cutting response time with cyber GIS is going to be important. So that's essentially what I wanted to
talk about and give you some idea of where the sweet spot is in the synergy between CyberGIS and GeoDesign, I want to shift gears a little bit for a few minutes and talk about some of the more broader issues of GeoDesign in the context of the Academy. Because I've argued right from the start that this is a, an opportunity for the sciences and the humanities to talk, to interact. Cyber GIS requires both. It requires imagination, creativity, subjectivity, and at the same time, science, objectivity, objective evaluation. So if we're going to bring together the worlds of humanism and science, some pretty radical things are going to have to happen. Implementing scientific knowledge in a decision-making context raises a lot of questions which we as academics often skirt around and try to avoid. Allowing the aesthetic and the scientific to collaborate is more difficult than it may appear. So what are the barriers to the vision? Number one, the very organization of the academy. We are not organized academically to allow this to happen. Funding mechanisms. Our funding mechanisms, again, partition the humanities and the sciences. The need for a common language. Again, typically the humanities and the sciences don't talk together. I want to talk briefly about each of these. So here at UC Santa Barbara is the organization of the College of Letters and Science. There's also the College of Engineering, the College of Education. But here's the, the central College of Letters and Science. And here is the Humanities and Fine Arts, and here is the Mathematical Life and Physical Sciences, and the Social Sciences, and the partition between them occurs right at the top right? and makes it very difficult then for them to talk. Promotion and tenure is problematic because while both sides recognize the importance of creative activity, creative activity on the humanities side is a totally different animal from creative activity on the sciences. In the humanities, it's about books and exhibitions and performances. And once uh, I was chairing the uh, program evaluation committee at Santa Barbara, and we were evaluating the Department of Dance, and the exit interview, when the uh, experts that we brought in to evaluate the department were leaving, we asked them what did they like about the dance department. And they said, one of them said, the bodies. So just to illustrate the point, <laughs> uh, on the science side, of course, it's referee journal articles, it's external funding. It's very, very different. And on both sides, there is a sense that tenure is something that comes from contributions to a discipline's core. Anyone who operates at the edges of disciplines is out of luck in many ways. The forces are centripetal. They run towards the center. They're not centrifugal. They don't look outwards. In the U.S., the funding organizations are organized the same way. National Science Foundation, budget of approximately $7 billion in fiscal year 2013. Fundamental science in universities. And you will hear very often around NSF, NSF does not do policy. NSF does not do intervention. Referee journal articles are the lingua franca of the National Science Foundation. By contrast, the National Endowment for the Humanities has only $150 million a year. National Endowment for the Arts has only 138 million. Right. So the very funding organization in the United States works against any notion that we're trying to marry, bring together the humanities and the sciences. This is, un unfortunately, it's rather long, but I, I rather like it. It's from C.P. Snow, who you may, um, if you're as old as me, uh, remember that in the 1950s, Snow was writing about what he called the two cultures by which he meant the cultures of science and the humanities, and about how they didn't speak. And what he was writing then, I think, is still very true today. This is a lack of conversation, a difficulty of conversation between two very different groups. So these are all, of course, old debates. Why revisit them now? Does geodesign have promise, or is it simply stillborn? Does it run up against so many barriers that it cannot achieve what we want it to achieve. Well, why re revisit them now? One, because the rate of change is accelerating. 
too, because we can see the mistakes of the past. We can see the mistakes of early efforts at design, which didn't consider all of the issues that I've been talking about this morning. We can see, for example, the impact of the housing developments in industrial Britain in the 19th century, or reconstruction of Europe and Japan after World War II. The uh, city of Glasgow recently hosted the Commonwealth Games, and many of the tower blocks that were built in Glasgow in the 1950s are now being torn down because they were badly built and they're socially a disaster. And one of the suggestions for the opening ceremony that was actually approved by the city council of Glasgow was to blow up two tower blocks as part of the celebration. I kid you not. The pushback from the community, of course, was horrendous and it didn't happen. So, and also then, because we know how to do better these days. Right? So here just are two illustrations of the kinds of situations that we are now in. This is China. China's great uprooting, moving 250 million people into cities by building tower blocks. What are the social implications of these tower blocks? What are they gonna be like 20 years from now? Are they gonna be like the tower blocks that were built in Europe in the 1950s that are now being torn down? Here's the plan for Chongqing, and tower blocks from sea to shining sea. So what then is the promise of geodesign? Tools that can support both the aesthetic and the scientific aspects of design. Aesthetics in sketch and visualization, science in evaluation and simulation. But perhaps more importantly, a new language that can provide a bridge because the language of spatial thinking, the language of GIS, has roots on both sides of the debate and does provide some basis for communication between the two sides. So there's a problem, I think, an aspect of this problem which has been, to some extent, solved. And we have an internet that supports both synchronous and asynchronous collaboration. So I hope what I've been able to do is to pushed down to some issues that I think are still major research issues in the promise of geodesign um, to show ways in which cyber GIS can uniquely provide support for geodesign and to talk about some of the barriers that still stand in the way of making this vision come true. So thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. <laughs> we do have time for questions to Mike. Yes, me. Well, I, I think it's pretty clear what those things are. Could you um, repeat you know, the question? I, I talked about... Mike, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, so the question is, um, how can we extend the basic data model, the representations of GIS, to accommodate some of the things that uh, are needed in a design context? And I talked specifically about interactions and relationships, about the third spatial dimension, about time, and about affordances. Um, why things are where they are. Right? Purpose, if you like. And in all of those cases, there has been, of course, discussion in the GIS literature about how to, about the need and about how, how to do it. The problem, what we have to, to really think about as researchers, is how to enable that at the level of the creative act. So how do you, for example, allow people to create three-dimensional designs? And that's something that AutoCAD has worked on for many, many years, and architects, of course, have done that. And people like Frank Gehry um, use technology all the time to create, to support three-dimensional design. 
the temporal dimension, I don't know. Um, we need to think very clearly about why time needs to be introduced into design. Um, perhaps it's through time in the sense of staging the construction process. Perhaps it's time in the sense of changing context. Uh, I don't know. That needs to be thought about, needs to be researched. Um, affordances, um, there have been several papers on how to represent purpose and the importance of purpose. Interactions at, at a um, creative level, I think, are very difficult to, to think about. And again, I, I'd suggest that's what we need to do as researchers. We need to be thinking about how to, how to, how to make these possible in a simple, easy to use, creative environment. Yes. Well, I think some of those are going to be represented in the assessment and evaluation. So we're going to be assessing designs against various ideologies, for example. Right? We're going to be assessing designs against issues of sustainability, issues of economic feasibility, issues of cost, etc. Right? And um, some of those perhaps are on the, on the creative side of things that uh, maybe rule sets such as the rule sets that are embedded now in City Engine, which has a great ability to capture the rules that limit constrained design. And so I think that belongs on both sides. It belongs on the creative side and also belongs on the evaluation side. Great talk, thanks. The Following up on, on May's question, what can't we represent? There is even a more technical answer, I think, and that's in the direction that you just mentioned, the rule sets. One term you didn't use is constraints. Yeah. And it seems to me that the real issue with both the representation and then also the solution, and also user interaction with, with design models, is that we are often not stating how it should look, but maybe how it should not look, that yes. the house should be more than five meters away from the road. Mm -hmm. And that was the topic of my PhD a long time ago. And at the time, AutoCAD said, well, we're almost there. Yeah. And in fact, Jack said, I have an engineer working on that. And we're interested in you know, doing the constraint solution part of the constraint representation. And as you say, 25 year, years later, we don't have the solution. So modeling constraints, representing them, and then solving them, that's may maybe where CyberGIS is coming in is are really, really tough problems, mm -hmm. computationally and, and yeah. interactionally. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, I really like that presentation of uh, mixi mixing the two. It's one of the best that I've seen in terms of bringing that stuff together, having looked at Carl's stuff for 15, 16 years now. Two things I have. In terms of the examples that you've seen, have you seen any, uh, uh, Carl has done all of these projects around the world, but the challenge with Carl's activity is that they're all one-off things. Mm -hmm. There's really not a reproducibility kind of yeah. thing and share broader with the world. And so, you know, Carl's got to be there and be there. And so I haven't seen any examples, even in my own work and uh, the work I've done with Piotr on uh, this, what I call sustainability modeling, then the geodesign framework as a six phase modeling process. It's so horrendous to try and bring together technology to visit really mm -hmm. in, a, in a robust way each of those six modeling phases. Have you seen anything like that? And I have a, another yeah. issue that may or may not be related to what May was saying. Non-representation theory. Have you ever been, I've seen it, I've looked a little bit into it because this is what May was referring to in mm -hmm. some sense, but there are critical social theory folks out there saying, and I go, Non-representation theory? How do you even think of anything if you non-represent it? So, so. There's a book but, on that. Yeah. Yeah. So at any rate, yeah. those two, thanks. Yeah. Um, on the uh, first one. The, uh, yeah. Um, that, that was always the, the underlying issue with spatial decision support systems, right? Which the literature back, back in the early 90s, were there commonalities? Could you build a generic spatial decision support system, a, a basic toolbox that could then be easily applied instead of everything being one of. And I think Night Song Lee, who's here, I think, is she? Yeah. 
did this wonderful job on the um, Spatial Decision Support System site, which pulled together a lot of that stuff. Um, one thing that stands in its way is the lack of interoperability between the component parts. And this has always been a, a dream of various communities, particularly in the environmental sciences, of creating interoperability between models, plug and play models. Um, pretty much every model that's ever been developed is standalone and makes its own assumptions about the underlying data and about the computing environment. <coughs> Reducing them all to, to easily pluggable elements is something that some progress has been made on, but typically only within smaller domains. So the ecologists have done a lot of work in that direction of making ecological models plug and play. And hydrologists have done some work in that direction too. But a common solution has always been elusive. Um, as Carl himself says, um, it's all very fine to talk about bringing in a model to simulate the, uh, the atmospheric effects of some development, but which of the 200 models are you going to use? Right? And none of them interoperable. So there's another re major research question. Right? How do you establish a common framework so that different models can be easily interchanged, can be easily pluggable? Um, you do it by building the foundation first. And once the foundation is built, you hopefully create enough incentive to make it possible for models to be integrated. And that's where I think the integration aspect of, of the CyberGIS project really has a lot to, to offer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To make it easier for models to be exchangeable, interoperable. Yeah. So um, I'm from parallel processing world, essentially computer science. And uh, I do see the difficulty that you mentioned in terms of art and science, mm. how to marry them. I mean, this is actually the major challenge. But in terms of tools, um, you know, what struck me actually is to look at how the chips are designed or how software is designed and the elaborate process that actually already is built in, you know, in terms of VLSI chip, you the placement, optimization, you know, interdependencies, logic simulation. I mean, there are lots and lots of tools. I'm just wondering if that's the way that, you know, this is going to go mm. or is there a relationship between the two? Yeah, well, there are interesting generalizations of, of design. Um, certainly in, in I, I know, I, I've, been driven in the past to read the chip design literature in order to solve geographic design problems. Um, certainly, there, there are interesting and useful um, relationships there. Um, I, I think also there are some interesting relationships developing between the sciences and the humanities. Having spent a lot of time working with the humanities at UCSB and realizing how skillful they'd become at generating their own code. Um, no, it was, a, it was a shock to me to think that people in the Department of Art History were writing code. And uh, so uh, I, I struggled with that for a while and thought, well, we used to, I used to think we wrote the code and they used it. Um, then they started writing the code. So then I thought, well, we know the applications and we give them the applications. No, no, no. They, they found applications too. And when I, when I finally saw a uh, project in the Department of Art History, which had taken Google Earth and used it as a tool for sculpture. I thought, this is, this is gone. Uh, what, what's basically happening here is that the humanities have better ideas than we do. <laughs> and that was, that was the real shock. Their, their, their thinking is much more um, expansive than, than we're, geographers tend to be terribly focused compared to humanists. Well, uh, thanks very much, Mike, for your very stimulating talk and uh, the discussions with the audience. Let's put our hands together again for, for Mike.